Okay, well, I'd like to start and say welcome everyone to Atlanta Ballet's Virtual Insiders event, Choreographing from Afar, a conversation with Claudia Schreier. My name is Mara Mandrajeff. I'm an instructor and researcher in the Dance and Movement Studies program at Emory University, and I am very excited to be talking with such a wonderful group of artists tonight. So uh, for those of you who just came in, again, another reminder to keep your video and sound on mute throughout the event. And please, if you have any questions, just type them up in the chat and hopefully towards the end of the event, we'll have time to get to them. So to begin, I'd like to just go around the virtual room and have our panelists introduce themselves, tell us what their role is at Atlanta Ballet and also maybe note how long they've been with the company. Let's start with Claudia. All right, thank you so much everyone for being here tonight. Um, my name is Claudia Schreier, originally from New York. Um, I am the choreographer in residence for Atlanta Ballet. Um, have been since early 2020. And um, my first uh, interaction with AB was um, a ballet that I made called First Impulse that premiered in September of 2019. Rory? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rory Hohenstein. I am the ballet master, one of the ballet masters here at Atlanta Ballet. Um, I'm relatively new here. This is my second season so far, but happy to be here. Welcome to Atlanta. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Asif. Um, I'm one of the dancers with the company. I am from Brazil and I've been with the company for four seasons. And welcome to this mm -hmm. conversation, everyone. <laughs> so, uh, hi, uh, my name is Guilherme Maciel, but you can call me Gui, that's easier. <laughs> I am also from Brazil. And uh, I'm a company member with the Atlanta Ballet, and this is my second season. Wonderful, great. So um, as most people know, the first part of Silver Linings just premiered this past Friday. It was wonderful. Uh, if you missed it, it is still available to watch on the Rialto Center's YouTube channel, which I believe we're going to uh, add the link to the chat. So please check it out if you missed it on Friday. Uh, in this show, we saw an excerpt from Claudia's new work, as well as a piece by Guy. So, um, but let's start with Claudia and just ask broadly, what was the concept behind your piece? What inspired this new work for you? Yes, yeah, so the, my ballet is called Pleiades Dances, which is named after the music by composer uh, Takashi Yoshimatsu. And it is, the, the, the work itself is 11 short vignettes, um, beautiful little piano solos that I've strung together. Most of them are uh, from uh, Yoshimatsu's work. Um, you know, the more that I get through the piece, my answer continues to change because it has been such a cathartic experience to make it. And um, we've really, I, 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 I I find myself falling more and more in love with the music as I make it because it has a sense of such complex rhythm and flow that I can't help but get swept up in uh, the, just the, the different ways that it all comes together. Um, and because I am one person in a living room uh, many, many miles away, it is um, such a wonderful way to connect with people. Um, and so the piece itself, Pleiades Dances, is technically a, well, the Pleiades are a star formation. And so abstractly, the work is based in these constellation type movements. And um, you will see when you see the full work that it uh, kind of has these abstract um, kind of throws to, to, to star formations. Um, and so the excerpt that presented uh, last week was there were two sections that were presented together will actually be separate um, when you see the full work uh, with all 11 sections. Yes. Um, well, now I, I know that you've been doing a lot of projects lately, right? I think for, for example, you did a piece with the Dance Theater of Harlem and Miami City Ballet. Um, do you wanna talk a little bit about this current piece's relationship to your other recent works aesthetically, how maybe is it the same or different? I know you mentioned a lot that the music um, inspires your guides you in your choreographic process, but is there something new about this? Yeah, I think it, it comes back to that sense of catharsis I was talking about. We've been so cooped up for so long 
during quarantine that I find myself moving in a way that is more, um, I don't want to say casual, but more grounded and more free form than perhaps I am accustomed to working and to moving and to creating. And so structurally, the piece is still very much based in ballet. It still has a lot of classical ballet elements, and it's based in classical ballet technique. Uh, pedestrian flair, perhaps, that I'm trying to infuse. That last part, I think. Yeah. Out? yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Uh, no, I was saying that uh, I'm, I've asked the dancers to kind of add a sort of pedestrian flair to the work and so that it feels uh, very free flowing and, and has a sense of uh, groundedness that perhaps I haven't explored in quite the same way to this point. Um, what kind of approaches have you taken in helping the dancers find that that space, that relaxed space? Because I know as ballet dancers, we're very always presenting ourselves, and sometimes people are like, "Just walk like a normal person. Don't walk like a dancer." <laughs> what kind of what is that process? Yeah, Rory, Rory can speak to that as well because we're you know we'll get into it, but Rory has just been extraordinarily helpful in in helping me to communicate and break down a lot of the um, the, the the meaning behind the movement. I guess is one way of putting it. Um, it's hard, yeah, especially when you're trained to be so up on yourself and to ground yourself and find your center at all times to, uh, you know, Rory and I have talked about this. It, you're not letting it all go. We're not, we're not going so far in the other direction that it, that it loses all sense of, of, of ballet. Um, but it's finding that middle ground between that, that classical clean element and uh, a, a greater sense of flow. And so it is like, I, I, I think I shouted at them last week. I was like, just walk like a person, just be a person. <laughs> it's easier to, to say that than to actually do it. Um, but I find that the freedom comes in by, by, by relating to the music more closely. I think I, through grounding myself in the music, I find that sense of, of flow. And so it, comes more naturally to me by adhering to the rhythms that I feel and by finding that sense of, um, yeah, that, that constant, constant rhythm and that constant flow. And then helping the dancers to hear it as well. Yeah, and, and dancers, do you feel like you've noticed that shift or that that type of aesthetic or embodiment through it? How have you been handling that? Um, I can speak uh, for myself since I, I did work with Claudia and Rory throughout the performance that we did at the Rialto. And yes, um, like she mentioned, you know, helping us to stay more grounded has been a challenge for me, I can say that, but um, very worth it. And I'm enjoying the process a lot. It's, um, it's good to feel other parts of your body when you dance something in a different way even if it is still classical, some elements, it has like a different muscle that you engage and a different movement that you use your body, you know? So it's, I don't know, it's very nice, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, some things come naturally actually uh, when we like relax and get so much easier. But like uh, the first thing that, we like try to do is like to build up so then we have like to come back even this is the hardest part the hard part of the process because we like we keep like going up and going down like gradually you know so it's not like something natural for everybody yeah but it's it's kind of cool <laughs> and i noticed it i mean i um know that on friday the facebook that there was a little bit of a technical technical issue during your piece, but I could see it in the choreography, kind of that pedestrian movement that you were talking about in the shoulders particularly. So it, it's resonating in your work nicely. Um, and speaking um, of, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna mention that um, I think that it's difficult when you have to make it um, with, you have to have energy and sharpness, but at the same time you have to relax so it creates more movement and not so, so much stiffness. So it's uh, interesting to be able to work on this more and more. 
Yeah, in ways that that will then translate into your other choreography or even your movements during class and what you're willing to explore. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but yeah, speaking about the show on Friday, this is something I kind of wanted to, to throw out there. Um, and then also thinking about just these virtual events in general. I think it brings up this larger question of what constitutes performing arts at this moment in time and particularly what the role of the camera, the role of the camera within that and directing the viewer's perspective. So for instance, like the camera's angle seems to change a lot during these recorded um, performances or live stream events to include things like close-ups. So I was wondering, Claudia, did that fact, did the fact that you knew this piece was going to be presented virtually affect the way you choreographed? Um, and I'm also kind of curious if you had any say in how the piece was recorded or if the videographer was yet another like artistic voice in the mix, right? Because the camera lens really is, it thinks a lot of specific ways of seeing the work that we wouldn't necessarily be privy to if we were watching it in person. This one is kind of a hybrid because we are creating works that we hope have a life beyond the live stream events. Um, and so they are very much created for, and they are created for the stage, it's still a proscenium stage. And so we're not recording from multiple angles, we're not recording from the wing or from behind. And so in that regard, it's very similar in the sense that when you're creating a work, you still, like not everyone's sitting center stage orchestra. You have to keep in mind who is all the way house right, all the way house left, you know, balcony and all of that. And so when you're creating, uh, especially group works that have a lot of formations and, um, and shapes and, 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 and things like that, you, you're still considering angles. So it's not just a one-to-one -one in terms of audience to, to dancer. Mm -hmm. However, when you do have all of these uh, new camera angles and these close-ups, um, it does allow you to reconsider how things are being captured. You know, if you have a, a, a clear sense of which camera is gonna be taking what, or if you can direct that, then absolutely that informs how you are going to be um, structuring certain elements. Um, I did, uh, Jessica can, can uh, speak more to this, but I, I was very clear about who's looking at whom and, and where the eyes go when you look back at your partner and how quickly the head goes back. And those things always matter for performance, but especially when you have a camera trained on you because you are that much more, um, you, are, you are, you know, giving the work to the audience in a, in a new way. You are, you're, you're, present, you're performing with your eyes just as much as you are and the side of your cheek, just as much as you are with your shoulder and your toe. Uh, and so I think that it allows us to hone in on the more human aspect, which I love, and it makes it more personal. So it's not just bodies in space. It's really, it's, it, it's really people. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I don't think people reflect upon that as much as like the choreography, how it is guiding you in different perspectives and that the, the focus of the dancer is part of that. Um, so I'd also wanted to kind of ask Guy similar questions because you choreographed for this show on Friday, the past Friday as well. Yeah. Um, have you always been interested in choreographing? Is this the first time you've created a piece? No, actually it's not the first time. Uh, I did a lot back in Brazil, but uh, more for ballet competitions with the students. But I have my first experience with the Mariinsky Theater in 2017 uh, during a choreographed project also. So this is my second time with a professional company working. So uh, it's something that I like to do. Um, and uh, it's tricky because I'm still a dancer and sometimes it's hard to like jump to another like kind of place, you know, but I love to do that. And also for me, I like with the, my particular piece, um, I try to think like more that's, we don't know like if it's gonna live, go like live or go just streaming. So I try to create something that's go well in every single way, you know what I mean? So you, which whatever angle you watch it, you can see the triangle shape that I try to keep like during the whole choreography because I had three girls performing. So yeah, I try to have cameras for myself, like to, you know, on the studio to see how the work goes. So I think pretty much that's it. And what kind of, what inspired that work for you? Um, actually first the music, 
that uh, is on the nature of the light by Max Richter, with the lyrics by Clyde Otis, like This Bitter Earth, the name of the lyrics. And so during the quarantine uh, of meditations and spiritual rituals to keep myself grounded through this, like, this situation. And then I try to like, give the audience back the same feeling that I have when I meditate to feel like myself calm, to feel like just have a nice moment. And that's it. <laughs> I think I, I did a good job with the girls. <laughs> was beautiful. And I, I think that, mm -hmm. that resonated again to the audience that we did feel calm, it was peaceful, and I, we all need that. Moment. <laughs> Silver lining. <laughs> um, nice. You were in person choreographing. However, Claudia, you've been out of town for most of this process, just communicating via Zoom. Have you ever done that before? Um, or you also explain to everyone the actual logistics of the rehearsal, how the studio was set up and everything. Yes, so this is um, it's one of the first things I've done on Zoom. I did uh, a couple of films. I did one for my NACB Ballet that premiered last year and another film for the New York Choral Society that's coming out at the end of this month. Um, but it is the new normal. It is the way to make work happen. And um, this is the first long form work I've done. So the other ones were, you know, three to five minute pieces and this for the 20 minute piece. And so it completely changes the way that you approach things because it's um, you're in it for the long haul. And so you need to like really create a system that works for everyone. Um, and one of the things that I have, so to explain the setup, um, I'm, I'm currently in Tennessee um, for no reason in particular. I just you know, wanted to be here with my husband, <laughs> um, but originally from New York. And so um, everything has been as Mara said, over Zoom. And uh, the dancers have been set up in these one giant studio essentially in Atlanta, but it is divided um, with regular dividers and then plexiglass. And Rory is stationed in the room, two large screens that patch in my face so that both, so we have two pods, we have two different casts. So cast one is in one room, cast two is in the other. Each one has a screen so they can turn around and see me or they can look at Rory. Um, and then every day Rory is kind of my, he's the intermediary, he's running everything because after, you know, as you know, doing a lot of these Zoom conversations, if you go three feet past your screen, no one can hear you. And so a lot of the time, the only way to communicate anything is for me to say to Rory what I need and then Rory goes to the dancers and then Rory has to shout out to the dancers and the, and the next pod behind the plus class so it's a really extensive complicated complex setup um, that has a lot of moving parts um, you can see how zoom is like lagging a little bit now you can imagine how frustrating that is when it happens you know a lot for three hours straight so sometimes you're at the mercy of, of wi-fi on on either end or both so just the technical aspect, like don't, not even getting into the artistic part of it, but just purely from a, a technical standpoint, there are so many um, new elements to the creative process as, as we go through this. Uh, and then in terms of how we are going through the rehearsal day, I will, you know, the music's also very complicated. And so we spend a lot of time going through counts and poor Rory has to get through every tiny little six, five, six, five, three, two, two, three, 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 two, three, two, three, two and then communicate that to everyone. Um, and then we get to the dancing <laughs> after everything else. Um, and it's been so incredible to have Rory because uh, he just intuitively understands what I'm asking for, even though sometimes he can only see me from here or sometimes it's just my feet. Um, he has this intuition about what I'm trying to impart to the dancers. And so with this multi-step process, you know, it takes longer than it would in person but what it does achieve is a mutual understanding. Like we all have to be on the same page and there's so much communication that goes into this that, that as we go through, um, there, isn't, there isn't really enough room for error to just kind of, you know, kind of get through it and then, and, then re, and then find it again on the other end. Like we have to really understand what we're talking about. So all 20 something of us are on the same page. Uh, so that's been, um, that's a silver lining. It's been a silver lining in the sense that it kind of solidifies the, the working process and it also um, allows me to rely 
on Rory in a way that I perhaps wouldn't if I were in person, were there in person. Well, in that in mind, I'd, I'd love to hear from Rory um, before talking about this unique situation that you guys have been in uh, for this year, uh, maybe just kind of articulating what it is that a ballet master normally does so that our attendees know what your role is normally and then how this has been different. Sure, it, it, under normal circumstances. Um, yeah, the ballet masters usually, um, we start the day by teaching company class um, and we, uh, we rotate days um, just to kind of give the dancers a break from having one of us teach every day. And, um, and then that's just kind of a short part to our day. The longer part of our, of our work day is usually spent um, either teaching repertoire that is coming back to the company that maybe had been performed a season prior or you know, a choreographer isn't coming until later. So we have the material and we're studying the material to then go teach it to the dancers in the studio. Um, or we have the choreographers with us um, in the room or via Zoom now, uh, as with Claudia. So we're pretty much um, there just to kind of uh, teach and get things as, as ready as possible for the stage. And then how has this been just now with Claudia, would you say it's just the Zoom or are these different kind of responsibilities you're taking on? Um, I mean, I think it's kind of um, a good mix of the two actually. I mean, in truth, um, I, I was trying to think about this, you know, usually when, when it's just a ballet staff in the studio with the dancers without the choreographer present and we're teaching the repertoire, um, that's kind of our chance to really move around the space. We can demonstrate more um, and it's more interactive with the dancers in coaching in talking about movement quality. Um, and then usually when we have a choreographer come in and we then turn into kind of, you know, the choreographer's assistant, essentially, where we basically sit down for most of the time while the choreographer is, is in the room with the dancers working. And we're usually notating uh, the choreography itself because that's our way of preserving a choreographer's uh, repertoire, basically. So we, we write out, you know, the steps and the counts for everything and who goes where and which patterns are happening, plus notating the music. Um, and so with this process through Zoom with Claudia, um, it's kind of married those two ideas. So I'm, I'm not just in the room with the dancers working around them and with them. Um, I'm also trying to notate as well. Um, so it's a bit of those two kind of coming together. So it does make it slightly busier, but in, but in truth, I, I have to say I've been enjoying it because it kind of breaks up the kind of monotony of one versus the other. So, I mean, I think honestly on, on for everyone's part, um, I think the most complicated has just been, you know, setting up the technology for it. You know, we, we you'll see us in the hallways like uh, carrying multiple tripods with cameras and iPads and iPhones and chargers everywhere. I, I mean, that has been the most complicated, I think for me. Um, just because I don't want to have to hold up Claudia, you know, I want her to be able to have the freedom to take all the time she needs um, to choreograph. So I don't want to waste time trying to set up technology. So that's been the stressful bit. It is. Everyone's kind of experiencing that. Well, the non-tech savvy people like us, <laughs> on anxiety. Um, well, I actually think we have a video clip of the rehearsal. So um, Trisha maybe wants to jump in and share the screen all the attendees can kind of get a, a look. And if, um, if there is a delay that you're seeing, we're also gonna put the link into chat so you can click it and watch it separately. Cause sometimes when we show a video uh, via Zoom, it's, it's a little delayed or choppy. <laughs> So Jessica would face 
uh, Jacob for her alligator. Yes, she can face up stage. Where are we coming from? We just went down the corner. Yeah, so we're coming from this Harlequin jump. She would be. Have you all there? And I want the next over to get the questions. Um, having seen that and kind of reflecting upon it, I don't know if uh, Rory or Claudia have any other kind of insights now that we have a visual of what's going on. <laughs> no? <laughs> I, no, I mean, I just, that, that, that's, that video, I think, perfectly captures uh, what it is like to be in the room. Um, so, I mean, what you, what you just saw is real. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will add the dancers are obviously masked for all of that, which adds another layer and um, I applaud them because I, so I was, I had the, the, the benefit of going to Atlanta uh, just for the, the couple of days leading up to the Silver Linings performance last week. And so that was actually my first experience being in the studio masked behind all the plexiglass and all of that. And it is hard. So <laughs> I really applaud them for on top of everything else they're doing, um, you know, dealing with the, the added complexities of, of, of staying so. Yeah, and I think that's one of the questions we have from in our chat from Lori Teague, kind of asking the choreographers um, in the creative process, did you have to think about honoring social distancing? Um, how did you handle that? And, and even in rehearsing, um, the dancers getting used to wearing the masks and that different kind of breathing pattern. Yeah, so that's the, the other major element in terms of creating this piece. Um, there, no one can touch. We have one couple um, that um, they, are, they are, I believe, engaged. And so they live together and so they can partner. And so there's a separate section I'm creating for them um, that will then be incorporated into the piece. But for everyone else, we are, it's, it's a socially distanced ballet. And so that has that, that like that that makes the piece what it is. It's a ballet. I think you know if, if I had started this music um, in a normal era, it would look very different. But I'm grateful for this chance to kind of challenge myself to work with dancers um, in a way where the interaction has to come through um, in terms of how they are moving in space around one another and not with one another. And that completely changes how I consider and look at and create movement. Um, and so that, that's, a, that's a big part of it. We have to, to, to figure out how to remain safe and still create something that is not so specific to the COVID era that when you're watching it on the other side, you think, well, this would have been great, except, you know, had it, had it not been for. Like, this needs to be a piece that we are proud of presenting at any point. And so that's kind of the goal in creating this, is, is making a ballet that um, is, is greater than it could have been because of the, the challenges. And kind of rising to that. Nice. Yeah. And then from the dancer's perspective, and we haven't really talked about this, what has what has been different over this pandemic year as dancers? Like how has Atlanta Ballet handled that? I mean, I heard somebody mention earlier separation into pods. You could kind of explain that a little bit to our listeners. 
Um, we are divided in three pods right now. So we take class in different studios. And sometimes we do like rehearsals in different studios, even if we are doing the same piece. But actually, I think we are doing a nice job because we can like, uh, we don't have many cases in, this, uh, in the company. So uh, yeah, I think that's it. We have like a, a daily screening that we have to do every day before we get to the studio. Uh, we have our champion temperature taking every day also uh, we have like everybody in different bars doing the class so yeah I think we're trying our best and we are doing good so far the hardest part is just like to dance to perform in masks but I mean it's, it's the new uh normal I guess yeah, Jessica, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I will just add that I think our company is doing a really good job that we are able to still work and um, do everything, even with the circumstances that we have to just adapt to. But even with that, we are just, you know, trying to get just one step closer every time to just be as we used to be. But yeah, I think we've been doing a good job. They've been doing and so we are also with the social distancing and all the measurements that we have to take care of, but to still be able to do our job. So you feel safe. And have you guys feel like you've gotten used to dancing in masks or is it still? Uh -oh. <laughs> it's still, it's very, it's it's still hard. <laughs> It's too hard sometimes, uh, yeah, if, especially when we have to do like longer choreographies or long exercise, uh, it takes time to like get used to it. Definitely. Yeah, it gets more hard, uh, it gets more puffy. It takes more stamina mm -hmm. because it's more, it's a, this is a filter there for you to get your air through, but it's, it's doable. <laughs> Yeah, it's the bubble. <laughs> it feels so much easier once those masks are gone and whenever that's safe. <laughs> yeah, we hope so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, kind of with that in mind, a question I want to pose to everybody is once the pandemic does subside and, and things are safe again, could you see yourself holding on to any of these new approaches that you've had to take while choreographing, rehearsing, or dancing? I mean, I, I guess we won't hold on to the masks when, if we can not wear those. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Things that you that you felt like you grew from this experience and or that worked really well? That you can jump in from anywhere and, and either make or clean up a ballet um, is going to, I think that's going to be something that everyone implements going forward in, in every company. Um, you know, is it something you want to do all the time to make a long form work, not necessarily, but it, it really, it, it's a, it's a convenience that I think we've always had, but hadn't really occurred to a lot of us until this point. Mm -hmm. And I think that it is extremely helpful, um, just to check in to, and, and, and to be able to make adjustments that you don't need to travel halfway across the world to, to make, I think is, um, is so helpful. So I, I will definitely be doing that. Um, and I'm also taking Rory away from the process because he's just been an absolute gift. <laughs> I think for me, uh, the best part of it is because in the last performance, my family back in Brazil was able to watch it. So I think it's good, like a good thing to have uh, digital um, performances because then we have we can reach more people. So I think this is a good thing that we can uh, use before COVID, uh, after COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I, I mean, I think that there's, I, as in any situation, there's going to be um, many positive things that I hope stick around uh, after we get past this, hopefully. Um, I mean, I, I kind of um, agree with Claudia. I think that it, it has opened up a new kind of era where we can have a little bit more communication if someone can't be uh, in person, which I think that that's a wonderful uh, experience. Um, 
a challenging moment, but I think is also for the better, even though it might not seem that way in the moment, is you know, Claudia and I have had many conversations because usually when you're trying to kind of either create uh, movement or dances or anything, you know, you a ballet is, you know, it's you, you have to touch people to kind of try and help mold them into a uh, shape sometimes. And so what's been interesting is, you know, Claudia and I will sit down sometimes and say, okay, well, how, what, what kind of vocabulary do we need to be able to kind of get them to kind of internally feel what we're trying or what Claudia is trying to kind of achieve in the end of it. And I think that that's kind of been um, interesting is finding vo new vocabulary of, of a way of speaking to dancers without just being able to walk across the room, you know, take their arm and put it across them or, you know, like pull them in a direction. You know, that that is so much easier to do than when you have to sit there and be like, all right, use your words. What am I gonna say? I, you know trying to figure it out. Um, and in truth, I mean, honestly, lastly, I'll just say that I think through the struggles of this kind of new uh, zooming uh, choreographic moment, I do think that um, a great thing is that I've gotten closer to Claudia maybe because we've had to have more dialogue together and kind of communicate through, you know, uh, TV screens and stuff. Um, so I'm very grateful for that just because it has been a wonderful process. I mean, it sounds, um, like it's overwhelming at times with technology and stuff, but in the, at the end of the day, it's been really special because of that, I think. And for me, that's definitely a highlight. Jessica, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Um, I, I guess I would say that learning how to deal with any challenge, it's gonna be a positive outcome if you in any way, like as for the dancers, like we had to, you know, stay in shape when we couldn't go to the studio. So we had to adapt. So I think just by adapting, it's already gonna be a positive outcome out of it in, ev in every way, I think. Yeah, I agree. And um, kind of thinking about what everybody has been saying throughout this conversation and what, came to my mind in watching that video of the rehearsal is that I, I think in some ways the technology makes the choreographic process clearer in the ways that choreography is really just translated through so many different bodies. Uh, right? So we have the choreographer uh, and in this situation that movement becomes mediated through the technology so then already the movement has shifted or is distorted in some ways, like the technology itself has translated it. And then it's embodied in Rory, who then presents it to the dancers, who then put it into their bodies with these new nuances and individual artistic choices. Uh, so it, it just seems to constantly reveal to me that choreography is this complex network of interactions and voices coming together and um, just highlighting the collaborative process of it. And hearing you all talk about it, that's really come has become clear to me. It sounds like you everyone was so depending on one another, you know, like Claudia's like, I couldn't have done it without Rory. And Rory was like, and the dancers were right there for me. So it, it's this moment that we're all coming together, which is really beautiful. Um, we have a few questions from the chat and just a reminder to everybody, yes, please put your questions into the chat. Um, for the choreographers, someone was wondering how old were you when you started choreographing? Um, how did you get started? So we heard from Guy a little bit that you started already when you were a few years ago, 2017, you had a show put on. Um, and Claudia, we didn't really get any background on, when did you start choreographing? Yeah, technically when I was 12, I made a solo on myself to the Arabian Nutcracker. Um, and I should have known then that this was kind of my destiny because I just, all I remember is obsessing over it. It was for like a, a summer camp talent show and I felt the same level of stress then that I do now <laughs> when I'm putting something together. Um, and I just needed to get it right as far as I was concerned and, and it's always kind of been like that. So um, I did that, I did a couple pieces when I was in high school. Uh, and then when I got to college, I had a, the opportunity to create for the student run ballet company. So I was creating on my fellow students, which is wonderful. And that's kind of how it all developed. I was, um, it was all technically extracurricular, but it became my passion outside of um, classes. And I continued that through and then after I graduated and went to Hoover. And then Guy, do you want to add a little bit more to your story at all? No, I think I started like 
couple of years ago, just um, helping my students through some competitions. And then I fell, I fell in love with it. So here I am. <laughs> um, yeah, and this pieces were really wonderful. And uh, we have another question, but I think it might be more to Elena Ballet rather than the panelists kind of asking if they're considering opening up a couple practice sessions to the general public. I mean, I, I don't know if that's particularly safe at this time yet is what I would imagine the response would be, but I don't know, Rory, if you have any insight on. Um, I mean, I, I, I think definitely right now, I don't, our building is very much, um, kind of a bubble for us to make it as safe as possible uh, because we work, you know, in in such close proximities with being inside the studio. So for us right now, our building is very, very much limited to, to only those who have rehearsals that day, um, really. And um, I mean, I think at some point, um, I th this is, like I said before, my only uh, second season here, but um, I do know that, it, you know, we do have open rehearsals sometimes. Um, I think actually last year one was, um, was with Claudia's rehearsal, if I remember correctly. So we do have them occasionally, um, but again, as in all things right now, um, the future, we'll have to just wait and see how, how things happen coming out of COVID and seeing what's possible there. Yeah. And you want to talk a little bit about upcoming events that Elena Ballet is hosting as far as performances? Um, I'm actually, I mean, we, I know that we do, I'm, now I'm put on the spot. Um, <laughs> I do know that we have our silver lining streaming coming up, uh, March 19th, um, with, uh, as Claudia, well, as mentioned here will be Claudia's full work. Um, and then we have, I believe three other choreographers that will be showing their works as well, that were also a part of the um, live stream that we did earlier at the beginning of the season um, from our studios. Um, so we basically kind of divided the, the choreographers up a little bit um, for the two live streams that are taking place. So that will be the next uh, event that we have, will be the, the March 19th stream. And would you all say because of COVID in this particular situation that this um, approach in letting the dancers choreograph could occur? Like, is that something that normally happens in Elena Ballet? I don't think, but I think you guys tend to bring in people. Um, this is like a big showcase of the dancers choreographing. That's, that's a pretty big deal. Any thoughts on that? Um, I, I can just speak a little bit. I mean, I think that, um, again, that was one of those moments where I don't know, you know, um, if it had happened in the past, I'm sure it has on some level, but I, just since I've been here and, and entering this season and not being able to, you know, to do the full work so we had intended um, for the remainder of the season, um, it kind of blossomed into this wonderful idea and, and Gennady was the first to kind of put it onto the table. And, and really just opened up and, and gave everyone the opportunity to say, hey, this is a moment. If anyone has any kind of spark in them that says, you know, maybe I wanna try this, you have my full support. Um, and that's really how it kind of happened. And, and I, th I think it's, it's wonderful. I know that I personally, as well as the rest of us in the building have thoroughly enjoyed watching um, everyone's pieces. Uh, and, and also the surprise because, you know, you don't really know someone in their choreographic ideas until you watch one of their pieces. Sometimes you have an idea, oh, maybe this might be more classical and then you watch their piece and it's completely contemporary and you're surprised by it. So I think that that's been another great aspect, but definitely, definitely a positive to, um, to this season of COVID for sure. Yeah. And Claudia, you had kind of mentioned that before as well as you felt like that was a really big highlight of this virtual season happening. Yeah, I mean, to see the choreographic voices develop um, from these dancers is just extraordinary. Um, and to see, you know, a lot of them haven't been choreographing that long, or maybe it's their first piece. They're so professional and, and so well structured, and they each have their own distinct voices, like Guy and Keith and Darian and Anderson, they all, like, you, you know it's their work. Um, and it's such a special thing to get to sit down and watch this other part of someone um, that you wouldn't ordinarily get to see. 
um, they're all beautiful dancers and they all express themselves in the studio every day and they bring them the most that they can bring to themselves to your work. Um, so you get to know them like that, but then to sit down and watch them create their own worlds with each other and to have, and the other thing is that they're working with colleagues and friends. And so there's a sense of familiarity that I think helps the pieces develop faster. And they didn't have a ton of time to put these things together. They look, when you watch them, and I highlight, I strongly encourage everyone to go and watch the YouTube link from last time. Um, they look like they were developed over a long period of time because you can tell that the communication between each of the dancers is so strong and so well developed even before they got in the studio that um, everything blossomed out of that. So I was just so impressed and, and um, I'm gonna rewatch that a million times and then I can't wait to see the next round. Um, in March. Me too. Guy, yeah. How, what was that experience like being a dancer and then stepping into the role as a choreographer? I know you kind of brought it up a little bit earlier, but do you feel like now what they're saying, everybody kind of has a different um, perspective of who you are and your artistic vision? Yeah, um, I don't like to talk too much if I'm here right now. So I think now that uh, the audience Sorry. <laughs> uh, I think now uh, my friends and everybody knows that I am more um, emotional choreographer and dancer. And so uh, I, I know that I can like go through it with my pieces. And, uh, but it was really nice to like, to have my friends to choreographing because it get me to know the, they uh, like what they have inside better more than just like uh, a normal day work, you know what I mean? So for me, it was like really special to work with them and I hope I can do this more <laughs> in the future. Yeah, did you, were you guys kind of just given free reign to go in and choreograph or were there any workshops or discussions or input from other people? Like, were you allowed to invite uh, Rory, could he come to your rehearsal and say, hey, you know, this, this, and that. That's interesting. What if you challenge me? <laughs> no, actually, uh, they give us, like, full space, like, whatever we need. Just, like, not do, uh, keep the uh, social distance thing. And that's it. That's the only rule that we have to deal with. But... Uh, Gennad let us to express ourselves the better way that we can. So that's amazing. I, I think um, I think that that was also um, just in kind of talking about the details of the pods that um, that that was uh, what Guy had said, like uh, everyone had kind of free option to choose whoever they wanted in their piece. But because the kind of pod situation um, it was kind of which comes first, you know, because we we try not to crisscross pods as much as possible. So once you're in that pod, you're kind of locked in there. So then, you know, it's it's kind of becomes a puzzle piece. So the choreographers kind of had to kind of look to see, okay, well, I want these people, but maybe I have to choose this pod because I've already started working for fun one day with this person. So it kind of added a little bit of a challenge there, just trying to organize the the day schedule wise, you know, just to make sure that everyone was happy and the choreographers felt supported and the dancers felt supported. Um, so that was fun. Um, well, in case, unless there's another um, question via chat, I have one last kind of final question to pose to everybody on the panel and it's broad, but just thinking, how has this year changed you as an artist? or what are you going to take away from this year? And obviously my continued past this year, I keep saying a year, but with this experience, how has it shifted you artistically? For me, just speaking very broadly, I just have such a, a greater sense of gratitude for what it is that we do, and that we have a chance to do it. Um, you know, I, I can, speak to like how physically I'm, I'm, I'm changing my steps. And, you know, I, I do, I do feel to an extent that it's reflected in, in this piece, not on, but just because I just feel like it's just one giant big breath for me <laughs> to get to just move. 
um, you know, in the in the confines of my two by three space in the side of my living room. Um, but to have the freedom to create and to have this incredible infrastructure, to have everybody at Atlanta from Kanadi all the way down, um, doing everything they possibly can to keep us moving, to keep the dancers healthy and and in the studio, to keep my screen on. To, like it's just there's so many moving pieces. And you know, like on, on any normal day, it's, it's enough to run a company. But when you start to get even a tiny idea of how much goes into just keeping the lights on, let alone everything else after that, um, it just really humbles you. And so um, even on the days where it's hard and you're exhausted and you're just pushing through, it's so good to remember that this is, it's a rare thing to get to do this. And it's a gift to, to, to do it every day. Yeah, no, I go. <laughs> I think for me is uh, <laughs> is that uh, we have a new perspective of everything. So uh, now I know that I need Rory, I need Gennady, I need Claudia more than ever because uh, it's it's like Claudia says, like uh, many many pieces come together. So now I can see more that we need each other to make everything like go really well the way that, that we need it. So I think this is a, what this year means for me. Rory or Jessica? Would you like to go next? Go next? <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> I, I think for me is just, um, just the ability, I think as dancers, we have to be able to adapt because things change in every way and the world goes forward and new things come. So you always have to be able to adapt. And like Claudia said, it is a gift to do what we, lo what we love every day. And we have to remember not to take it for granted because with the routine that you do every day, you kind of forget that sometimes and I think just because we had to struggle a little bit more this time, it just helps you to just even be stronger. I think, I think the struggle makes you stronger, you know? <laughs> yeah. Spoken like a true ballet dancer, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Lori. Um, I, I... I said it before, I mean, I'm relatively new here, but I, I think um, I'm grateful to be a part of, of an organization that really um, cares so much about everyone in the building and it, and their safety. And and I think that it's kind of united uh, all, all fronts of, of the building. You know, it's not easy for dancers to not be able to be on stage. It, it's like the hardest thing in the world. Um, and so I think that it's been beautiful because there's been a collective kind of um, joint like of like effort to get somewhat back to normal as much as possible through silver linings, through streaming what we can and, and rehearsals in the studios and breaking out in the pods and stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful to that. I mean, I do think that, you know, sometimes going through a difficult time like this can bring out the best, um, um, and I also am grateful to Claudia, which she knows. I, but, um, but no, I, I do think that um, this experience working with Claudia through these means has been um, one that I will always remember. And I think that the dancers will as well, because I think it's a really special time, actually, um, as difficult as it may be, like the, to create in this atmosphere, I think is going to... Um, resonate I think with all of us and I'm just grateful that it's Claudia because she's a wonderful uh, human as well as choreographer so we're grateful to have her yes <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the like virtual <laughs> <laughs> um well we do you have one I know that I said that was my last question but somebody did write something in the chat and their eight-year-old daughter was curious. She's loving the conversation. And she was curious how everybody got started in dance. So maybe we could just bounce around the room real quick and just say, when did you start dancing and what got you into dance? And that would be a fun way to end too. 
I, um, I saw my first ballet. I was the Sleeping Beauty at American Ballet Theater at age two. And then my parents put me in creative movement at the YMCA, or the Y, and um, the East Side in New York City. And that was it. So super early. Uh, I started age of 11 because my father thinks that I was a good dancer in parties. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's how I started. <laughs> Are you still a good dancer at parties? <laughs> Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I try my best, I have to say. Um, I, I, oh, sorry, Jessica. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so I started when I was four. Um, my mom just put me to take ballet class, but I, I remember she told me that I told her that I wanted to take ballet. So it was, I, somehow I knew that that's what I wanted to do <laughs> from a very young age, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, I started um, when I was uh, six. I had, seen, I had seen the movie White Nights with uh, Bershnikov and Gregory Hines. And I, um, I was obsessed with Gregory Hines. I always kept asking for the shoes, the, his tap shoes that he was wearing. So eventually I was put into dance, not in ballet for uh, some time, but for tap and uh, jazz and all that. So it's because of him that I'm here. It's amazing. Um, well, I think we're pretty much at time. Uh, so I just wanna thank all of our panelists for sharing their experiences with us tonight and thank Elena Ballet for organizing and hosting this event. It's provided such an important space for artistic voices to be heard. And lastly, to thank everyone who has attended for your time and attention and, and the questions that you offered. Also, be sure to tune into the second performance of Silver Lining. Um, as we mentioned, that's March 19th. And I think there's some information about that in the chat as well. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful night. <laughs>